everybody, and welcome to the second official episode of the Moving Forward Talk Show. And I am your host, Jennifer Collins. These are my friends, Christy and Emily. And we would like to bring you along as we demonstrate for you how you can have an excellent life after leaving a high demand religious group. We always like to say that life goes on and healing happens. You just have to keep moving forward. Today, we thought it would be a fun topic to address dating or courtship if you had dating prohibited in your high demand group, romance, weddings, engagements, all the fun stuff that goes along with becoming a couple. Christy and I have been blessed in that um, after we left our high demand groups, our marriages have been intact so far. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so um, John and I have 28 years and uh, Emily has been blessed in that she gets to start her relationship without all the fun of being in part of a high demand group at the same time. So we will all have different perspectives, especially since Christy wasn't part of a high demand group at the beginning when she met her husband. Is that right, Christy? Sure. Um I was not raised in a high demand group. I was raised in a Methodist church. My family was very, very conservative. Um, so it wasn't that far of a leap, but I certainly had uh, a lot more freedom and, uh, and a lot fewer rules, a lot less, uh, strenuous requirements on a courtship, um, or dating prior to, um, entering this relationship that ended up being the relationship that uh, resulted in marriage. So um, it was a, it was definitely an experience. I have noticed as a mother of sons that it can be very complicated raising children to be accepting of other people's boundaries because the, my two of my sons graduated from homeschooling and there are lots of very conservative families in homeschooling. So naturally in their circles, they run into lots of conservative little girls. So it's, while not putting lots and lots of requirements on my sons, I've taught them to be very respectful of other people's ideas about, you know, how a courtship or dating should be entered into and how it should be conducted and just always try to keep everybody comfortable. That's kind of been my mantra with them. Try to always keep everybody comfortable in that way. You don't have to worry if everybody's comfortable. <laughs> so, but it's, yeah, it can be tricky not knowing what the other person expects. I thought it would be fun to start off by telling a fun story from each of our relationships. I didn't care if people told a story about meeting one another or a proposal or a first date, but just a story that you like to tell when you're out with friends, something that makes you think about your relationship and makes you smile. So um, I, of course, have one in the back of my mind. But Emily, do you have one figured out that you'd like to share, first of all? I do, actually. It's kind of interesting. You married in the message. Christy married out and went in, and I was in, and I'm going to be marrying out. So we all kind of have our own little niche of our high demand group uh, <laughs> affecting us. So my second date with the man that I'm engaged to be married to in September, September 21st is our day that we're planning on. And uh, so our second date, we got together and we had hamburgers and then we hung out by the back of his pickup truck, drinking hot chocolate by the local gas station, telling stories of our high demand groups because he grew up uh, independent fundamentalist Baptist, I think it is. Um, and then he went to school at Pensacola Christian College. So they had a lot of rules. So it was kind of, imagine the scene on Jaws where they're sitting around the table and they're like, yeah, but have you seen this scar? And this is the story from this. Well, yeah, well, I had this happen to me. <laughs> so we kind of had those stories and it was like, really refreshing to be able to tell a story and not have to explain all the nuances behind it 
And I'm sure even for him, like when he told the story of in the dorms at college and they'd wake up all the men in the middle of the night and line them up against the wall and measure their hair and make sure their hair was short enough, you know, and just like catch them off guard or <laughs> all that stuff. So, um, yeah, definitely. Inter that's my story I like to tell of, uh, yeah, I wasn't in my high demand group, but it's definitely, it's part of who I am. And uh, second date <laughs> conversation right there. But it was, it was, it was kind of a fun, relaxing, like, okay, I can be myself by this guy. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing, Emily. And you know what, that's sort of, that's that feeling of being comfortable and somebody gets you. That's kind of what I'm after with moving forward. I'm hoping there may be people out there who they're the only person in their community who used to be in a high demand group in there. They may feel isolated. They may feel odd. And I'm hoping they can watch us and listen to us and have aha moments and think, that's right. I remember that feeling. It was just like that. And um, it could be a little cathartic maybe for some folks. How about you, Christy? Do you have a story to share with us? Oh, man. Um, I have several. I, I don't know which one I want to like focus in on and talk about. I, uh, I'll, I'll share a few small little things. Um, when, when I first met my husband, I was actually in like second grade. Um, we went to the same elementary school and I knew who he was, but I don't think he had any idea who I was, but he lived across the street from the elementary school and, um, he would like walk home. So everybody knew who his family was because you could, we were all sitting on the bus waiting to ride for an hour and go home. Um, so I knew who he was and who his family was. Um, I never thought anything strange about his sisters wearing skirts. Like it, none of that ever con made contact with any rational, like thinking part of my brain. It was just a thing. It was how they dressed. Um, so I knew him from then we went to elementary school. We went to middle school together. And then when we got to high school, we went to separate schools, <clears throat> different high schools. Um, none of this time were, were we like, did we know each other? We didn't know each other. Um, then we get to high school and we start working at the same restaurant and it is a yummy chicken place that's closed on Sundays so that we could both attend church, you know? Um, so we started working there. We got to know each other just as friends talking in the back. Um, yeah, he, um, we went to a birthday party together for one of our coworkers. It was a friend of mine. Um, and we went as a date. He picked me up in his brother-in-law's Corvette. It was really nice. Um, so that was really sweet. And um, what I really liked about my husband, about Ben, was that he was supportive of me and my dreams. I had big goals for myself. Um, I always knew I wanted to go to college. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I was committed to doing that. And he was all on board. Um, not really the typical message man sort of mindset about his future bride, but my husband was into it. He really wanted a partner in life. He wanted someone who was alongside him in everything. So we actually graduated high school the same year and we started college the same year at the same school. Um, our degrees are kind of tangential. He's in electrical engineering and I'm in computer engineering. So about 80% of our classes were together. Um, and he likes to joke with people that if you can go to college with your significant other and stay a couple, then you for sure are, are going to make it in life. Like there's, there's not a harder like test of a relationship than being in lab for four hours with a project that doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. So many of the <laughs> things that you said just really, I could identify them a with them a lot. Like, I'm like, did we marry twins? But no, he's a lot, your, your Ben's a lot younger than my John. <laughs> so when, when my husband asked me out on our first date, um, we had known each other for a little while and I thought I wasn't going to get to go to church that morning because I had to work. So I went into work and they, it was a slow day and everybody knew I didn't like to work Sunday. I said, now that you have, you know, the 730 people in here, is it okay if I leave and go to church? And I said, sure. So I went to church. And then after church, my husband to be that I didn't know was my husband to be was outside talking to the young people after church. And 
someone asked him if he was going out to eat with the young people after church. And he pointed at me and said, is she going? <laughs> and I was going. <laughs> um, so then that was sort of when the sparks began to fly. There had been some chemistry early on, but we went to the restaurant and um, I sat with my husband-to-be, his little brother, my little brother, my little brother's best friend, and another guy. So I was the only girl at the table. <laughs> there was The only person even close to my age was my husband-to-be. After that, we went over to a friend's house to play board games or card games or something. And John was particularly quiet. And I thought, this is so weird. I don't, you know, he, he wanted to know if I was going, but you know, now we're in this setting with where we could be socializing and he's just being super quiet. What I didn't know was that he was mentally rehearsing his speech to ask me out on a date. <laughs> so I had gone in the bedroom to get ready to go back to evening church and someone comes to the bedroom and says, John Collins wants to talk to you. <laughs> And I go outside and he starts off on his speech. Well, I just moved here and I don't have a job yet. I don't know when we can go out on a date, but when we can go out on a date, which about that time I had already said yes. And he was still in his speech about how he really wasn't worthy to ask me out on a date, but he was going to anyway. <laughs> so we had this future date in mind. And when he finally arrived in his Trans Am, he had a single red rose on my seat. And that was, this is like a month later. We went on a date and after when we came home after the date, I was wearing his class ring and all my friends thought I was nuts because I'd gone on one date with this guy <laughs> with Marty wearing his class ring and he's giving me a rose and we were just head over heels after one another. So that was in, I think he asked me out in May and then that was probably in June. We had our first date in July. We found our engagement ring in November was our wedding all the same year. <laughs> oh, wow. We did go to college sort of together, but completely different majors. And we were married at the time and um, roommates in our apartment. <laughs> so, <laughs> I thought we would start out with dating or courtship since that's usually the earliest part of everyone's life. I remember growing up being very fascinated with the idea of one day having a boyfriend, one day having a husband, um, so the way that I approached that, because we lived out in the middle of nowhere, we listened to tapes on Sunday. Um, we would go over to another family's home and listen to the tapes. And so I, there was a book in our house called questions and answers, and it had, it was topically arranged and had quotes by William Branham. And there was a, there was a section on dating or courtship, something like that. And so I read every single quote that was in that section about dating and romance, probably at age eight or nine, whenever I could digest the the stuff. So that was, I was deep into the idea of how to, how to, how to properly, you know, get engaged and get married and, and do everything right. According to the message. I don't know if any of you were that invested in the message and research and reading what William Branham thought. Surely Christy wouldn't have had to because she wouldn't have known who William Branham was when she was eight or nine years old. No, I didn't. But um, when I was growing up, the way that I, I was taught, the way that our church sort of approached dating um, was that it was an interview for your marriage. So casual dating was not a thing. Um, and it was really, really not something that I engaged in. Um, in my teenage years, I met my husband when I was 17. So limited dating experience there between the age of 15 when I was allowed to start dating and when I met my future husband. Um, but I didn't have very many close, you know, dating relationships. And it was always this, this idea that this leads somewhere. This isn't something that we do casually. Um, there were a lot of books that were around when I was, um, Growing up, uh, I Kissed Dating Goodbye is a really good example of one. Um, that book had like a place of prominence in our youth building at our Methodist church. Um, I don't remember having a Bible study with that book as a material, but I know that that happened um, within the church that I grew up in. So that that idea that 
that dating is a serious thing, that you do it to meet a future spouse. That was there. Um, the message rules were something I was playing catch up on. Like as soon as I met my husband, I was trying to like figure out what the rules were. Sometimes after I had already violated the rules unknowingly, you know, and people would be like, well, Christy, why are you in the car with a man that you are not married to and you don't have a chaperone? And I'm like, I'm not allowed to ride to church with him. Um, so that came up one time, it's just different things like that. It was a big learning curve for me. How about you, Emily? Did you have any early ideas about what dating should be like? I was like terrified of it, yet wanted it so bad because that would completely complete me as a woman, yet I didn't know who I was as a human. So it was a very conflicted time, plus from situations that happened when I was just entering my teenage years, I really... I mean, I'd go along with it because that's what all the girls were doing in church. Uh, but really, I just kind of didn't like guys at that time and I hated guys. So I had a very, I never really dated in the message, which is a good thing, I think, for me. Um, I know a lot of friends that did end up getting married and the message left and then everything just kind of went upside down. Like you said, you guys are blessed that you're um, out of the message together and still married. So I have, I get to sit here and listen to your dating experiences. <laughs> it was, I was terrified, you know, it's the whole, if you kiss someone on the lips, it's as if, you know, those are your, those are your sex glands. It's as if you've done something else. So I was terrified because all the teachings I heard and, and you know, <laughs> then you watch a, like worldly, parents and kids and they'll kiss their kid you know f on the lips and you're like oh no what are they doing <laughs> so yeah but listening to you with the whole you know christy oh being in a car alone with a guy that's like so cultural i'm thinking about when i went overseas and there was a pastor that needed a ride in a car and you know, it's like a 45 minute drive. They don't have vehicles over there and it was getting late. And I declined him thinking I'm doing good. I'm not looking like evil uh, with a pastor in my car alone driving through, you know, um, the wilderness here. And then I found out later by doing that, by denying my um, uh, what do I want to call resources to him. I was actually looked down upon in the tribe by being like snooty that everybody's like, people know if you're up to something or not. It's no big deal. You have resources to share. I found out later that like you let your driver or your whatever have the spare room in your house. If he's a single man, you're in the house. You're not doing anything. You have a resource to share. So this is kind of interesting. I'm sitting here thinking about this, listening to you guys going, Man, so <laughs> yeah, this so keep talking. This is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Some of those lines are so arbitrary. Um, I I was never taught that. Um, my my we lived in an Amish community. I attended an Amish school when I was growing up. My mom was um, worked as an Amish taxi driver, if you will. She was a driver for money. Um, that was one way to make money when you had small children. <laughs> Your husband worked. Um, outside the home, but you didn't have a career. So she would, she, and really, I don't think they made much money doing that, but it was a way to get goodwill in the community. So, um, and there were lots of times that it was my mom and an Amish man, you know, going to the grocery or to an interview with a client or something for a carpenter or whatever. So that was never part of my upbringing, but it's funny how um, different, different regions, different countries have culturally different expectations. I remember I have a a, a, fam a, a family of neighbors now and they are Muslim. And I offered the, the elderly gentleman was needing to go to work about, I don't know, half a mile away. And he was standing outside on a sun sunny summer day. And I was like, um, his ride's not coming. So I offered him a ride and he, he declined, you know, but, um, I didn't, I don't know if that was religion or not knowing who I was or their culture or what it was, but I did offer <laughs> So anyway, so that's just so interesting. Um, you alluded to the kissing on the lips 
regulation. <laughs> and um, I think that is something that the, the message shares with a lot of other high demand groups. Like I think about the Duggars, they have, they make a big deal about their daughters not kissing before marriage and their first kisses at, you know, at the altar and their wedding. And um, so I think there are a lot of people out there who will hear that statement and say, oh yeah, I remember that. That was, that was part of my experience as well. So Anyway, so that those were kind of getting into the rules. Um, did you all have any more dating stories that you wanted to tell before we get into more in depth in the rules about dating? I don't have any any specific stories. I just I know that for for me when I first came to the message church and started like hanging out around my husband, um, everyone was really nice. Everyone's really casual. Like, oh, there's a new girl coming. She's coming with Ben. And they, they were kind, um, <clears throat> but as it became more and more obvious, this was going somewhere, um, that kindness sort of ended <laughs> for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, the, the goodwill and the, the, the grace with me on not knowing the rules sort of had this abrupt end. And all of a sudden I was expected to know, um, the things that I should know. I should know that, um, you know, the way I should dress is the way I should dress everywhere. I didn't know that. I thought the women wore dresses to, to church and then they went home and they dressed normal or like didn't necessarily change the way that they dress. Cause, um, one of the first kind of conflict with that, that I had was I was working at Chick-fil-A and we had a uniform and it was pants. Um, I, I had never seen anybody wear a skirt while working at Chick-fil-A and I had no comprehension of the idea that I'm supposed to be wearing a skirt when I'm at work too. Um, and that was, that was a huge milestone. Um, it was like some of the ladies at the church came up and ordered food one day and I'm there in my pants. I'm kind of not phased by it, but they certainly were. Um, it's just minor things like that. Um, and things like any sort of affection in, in front of people. So I liked, we liked to hold hands and there was no kissing on the lips. That was not allowed. But um, me and my, my husband, when we were dating, we liked to hold hands. Um, we were affectionate. We made the googly eyes and all of that. And it's very frowned upon in the message to do any of that. Um, it's supposed to be very stoic and I don't know exactly how they expect you to interact with your significant other while you're dating. Um, but it certainly wasn't the way that naturally occurred to us to act. Um, so that that caused problems. So, Christy, I had the same upbringing that you did as far as um, dating is for a reason. Um, and um, it's for the person to try to find the person that you're going to marry. It wasn't that you had to marry them if you dated them, but you were supposed to be looking for someone to marry. That was the whole idea of dating. Um, I think I was 11. Um, this, my best friend was 12. And so there was a family, a large family who had brothers. There were two brothers who were interested in the two of us. And so the older one was interested in my friend and the younger one was interested in me. And my, my family told me, no, you're 11 years old. You may not have a boyfriend, even though he's not old enough to drive and won't be taking you anywhere. You can't go steady. He can't be your boyfriend. And I told him that he was crushed. <laughs> and uh, I said, we can be friends. Um, and then he wanted to hang out. And I'm like, well, your sister was my friend first. Let's all three hang out together. He didn't think that was cool at all. <laughs> then when my older friend broke up with his brother, he decided he liked my older friend. And then of course I was crushed. <laughs> So it was just, I don't know. I think it made for a lot of drama that was unnecessary, probably. <laughs> On the other hand, if I'd have been allowed to be somebody's girlfriend when I was 11 years old, probably would have made for more drama, even more heartbreak. <laughs> I remember hearing hearing that um, that man visited in here where I live and went to church and talked to my brothers and said, you mean Jennifer's married? I didn't think she would ever get married. I don't know. You know, he thought I was, I don't, I don't know. I guess he thought I was one of those people that Paul said was called to be single for their whole life. I, I don't know what the deal was, but apparently he thought I would never get married. That was kind of a funny story for me, but that was a little bit more about the rules. 
I think of all my friends, they go down to camp somewhere, or do something, and I wasn't allowed to do that because that was a little bit too worldly. And all girls did is went to camp to go look for guys, and that shouldn't be the purpose. And so, <laughs> and what was the name of that? Oh, it was like a big thing, and I didn't have the internet. Perch, that remember Perch? That was like some back in the day of, uh, oh, what was the other, the early messenger programs and you'd go and you'd go chat and it was like so cool and you know my friends are like oh I was talking to this boy and I wasn't allowed to do that but I'd go over to the neighbors and sneak into some of those conversations and just kind of watch silently but I was like the awkward silent person in the corner that wanted to be involved and I was involved in my head but I was just like the creepy kid standing there silent off to the side not talking to anybody buddies so yeah i was super super awkward and all the girls were like oh my gosh this guy he's so hot you know and i'd try to join in but i just felt awkward about it so <laughs> yeah <laughs> so your parents made up rules that were even stricter than the rules that the other message kids in your area had huh Yes, I was actually at the time, it was not cool to homeschool. So I was like the only homeschool kid at the time in my church. And I was like, always picked on and stuff. And I was picked on by my cousins. And yeah, I was always kind of the outsider looking in, never feeling like I, it was funny. Here I am in a high demand group who does not fit in with the world around them. And then I'm in my own little bubble within the high demand group, not fitting in with anybody. So it was super awkward. Yeah. That's why it was such a relief when Pete and I were sitting talking about, yeah, well, I have this story about this story. So like all the awkwardness could just go away <laughs> during our second date and it still continues. There's times we have stories where we remember is like, oh my goodness, I cannot believe we went through that. <laughs> oh goodness. Yeah. So I thought my next, if we, if we're finished with rules, um, I thought my next idea we would talk about would be like interference or pressure from parents. I know there might be some people who feel pressure from parents to date or to be looking for a spouse when they're not ready. And there might be other people who have interference, you know, with people telling them who they should be looking after, who they shouldn't be looking after, um, or trying to date looking after. That's kind of an old fashioned term, I suppose. <laughs> but um, do either one of you have anything that you remember from growing up about where people had pressure or interference, or maybe it's something you witnessed as a part of a high demand group where you saw someone whose romance was hampered, um, or maybe they were pushed into a relationship that didn't work for them. Um, I, I saw a lot of young people, especially around the time that I met my husband. Um, there was a lot of effort. This was in 2006 2007 um a lot of like interest in that time of finding partners for people that were my husband's age um and like the youth of that time and i know that that's continued um there's there's always been youth camps and the expectation is you go there and you're looking for someone that you can you can date and you can be with because um, dating outside of this thing is really frowned upon. Um, I know that my husband was the exception to the rule dating outside of the group. He never intended to date outside the group, had never dated outside of the group before he met me. Um, so it's not something that's normally done. It's, it's certainly the way a lot of people find spouses because churches are small and message communities are uh, you know, kind of split apart. Uh, geographically, it's hard to forge a relationship when you're a thousand miles away from um, somebody that's an appropriate match for you, quote unquote appropriate. Um, <clears throat> so there's definitely been youth I've seen, um, especially young ladies that are sent off to camp around the age 16, 17, 18, with the expectation that they come back having met someone appropriate. Um, and then once those appropriate relationships are met, 
parents go above and beyond to try and facilitate those relationships. I have seen teenagers sent to stay with families thousands of miles away because they're dating, you know, brother so-and-so's cousin, and um, they can stay with this other family and be around them a little bit more and kind of cultivate that relationship because doing so from afar is obviously a challenge. So I have definitely seen a lot of that. It makes me really sad for them (laughs) because it feels like the relationship isn't built organically. I know that some of those relationships have been very happy ones. Um, You can find your partner in any way, Uh, but some of those relationships have been really trying because they don't have enough time one-on-one before a marriage to determine whether or not they are a good fit. So I know that's really hard in a high demand group to find someone that is a, that's allowed, that's that's accepted. How about you, Emily? Did you witness any of that kind of pressure or interference or have any of that yourself? Um, pressure and interference. Uh, yeah. Can it not be past tense? Can it be present tense from my parents who are still in the high demand group and have their opinions of uh, what they think of this young man that I'm dating and going to marry um, because he obviously is not in their high demand group and no one outside of their high demand group will measure up to their ideals and expectations. So, you know, I'm slightly could be a disappointment, I think, behind the scenes to them because I'm not in their high demand group. And now that I'm dating a man who uh, will smoke a cigar or say a cuss word once in a while and doesn't go to their church and, you know, maybe even drives a Ford because they're Chevy people. I don't know. Uh, That's an exaggeration, but it's just it's a unique dynamic. And there's... (sighs) And him being on the spectrum, he says and does things, too, that aren't quite expected. And so there's judgmentalism. You know, it's not pressure. It's judgmentalism. There's, there's, you know, Christy being judged to being at Chick-fil-A in her pants. You know, it's all this listening to she reached this point and then all of a sudden all that disappeared and she was expected to follow all the rules the love bombing as they call it in high demand groups ended and all of a sudden you're in our group now you must follow our rules and a lot of expectations for people not in the group on the periphery uh you must follow our rules too so it's yeah again sitting here listening to you guys my head's just spitting in these stories going oh my goodness it's very interesting the very different perspectives the three of us have and how this high demand group really really influences every aspect of this it's just absolutely incredible and that's not the biblical way i'll just leave it at that i know um one thing that i have seen through the years. And I think it's changing even in the message for the better. Um, And that was interracial relationships. Um, When I was growing up in a relationship, interracial relationships were frowned upon quite a bit. Um, And as a matter of fact, my grandmother, who was not even in the message, I was talking, I was probably maybe about 14 or 15 years old. I was talking about a guy that I liked and I said he had curly hair. And she said, well, you got to be careful about that because you don't know who he has in his family tree that's causing his hair to be curly. And that's horrible. That just makes me cringe. But I mean, you know, my grandmother died at 96 years old. She was alive in the in World War II and she just had not come where we are in the 21st century at all. And um, I feel like because the movement that we were a part of, the man died in the 60s, um, I think a lot of the mindset kind of stuck in the 60s. Like, I know that a church that we used to go visit sometimes where family members were, they had, you know, some couples there who had were a different race. And they felt like they were very progressive because of that. And um, I even leaving the message, that was one of the last things to go, I will have to say, is my idea that, you know, that what William Branham said about different colored flowers shouldn't be mixing together. It took me a while. It did. It really did. And I'm ashamed to say that because now I would, you know, I would have told myself differently. (laughs) 
<laughs> but that's one of the things that I, one of the ideas that I want to get across in this um, talk show is people do change and I've changed. I'm so thankful that I've changed. <laughs> But that was one kind of pressure or interference that people might run into in the high, high demand group I was a part of. So I have down positives or negatives. Um, I don't know. As a mother of young men, I can see that there are some positives maybe to some of the ideas. I, I know that uh, my son had a young lady say she didn't want to be his girlfriend and he decided, well, he didn't know that dating was such a great idea if she didn't think that that he was boyfriend material. And I, I can think that being that serious minded probably is not a bad thing, you know, and not not that you always have to be. But at certain stages in life, you know, you don't want to waste a whole lot of time running around after people who aren't that into you, if you will. <laughs> I've heard, I think that that was a book. I think I remember hearing people talk about she's just not that into you. <laughs> that was one positive I could pull out. You know, y'all come up with any positives at all? <laughs> I don't know if this is, it's certainly not normal for the message, I don't think. Um, but one of the things that I experienced in my courtship dating process with dating my husband, um, because we didn't come from the same background and I was, I was dating him and he had all these very, very different opinions. Um, and he didn't know, he didn't have like the firm basis for what he thought. He just knew like, this is the way it's done. This is, he, he didn't have, he couldn't like pull out the, you know, the message tape and like year and number and like quote me what William Branham said about anything. Um, so dating somebody that has a very different background from you and, and dating someone who, who challenges your preconceived notions about dating, who's outside of your culture, quote unquote, um, was super helpful for him. I think, um, it's, it has a positive and a negative spin, right? So we we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what was right for our relationship and for dating. Um, we would sit down and like look stuff up. What, what did William Branham say about this? Um, what is the rule for this? Um, and we had a lot of discussion, a lot of dialogue because of that. And all of that was really healthy for our relationship, I think. Um, I can't say that that's necessarily the norm in the message. I think that if if you date someone in a high demand group that's already in the same high demand group, opportunity for those conversations to get to like the deeper why we're doing what we're doing, um, they don't happen. But dating somebody who comes from a very different background than you, even somebody from a high demand group forced us to have those productive conversations and I think that was very positive. The negative side of that, of course, is that his his background and the message was much more rigid than mine. So where mine bent, his was unyielding. Like we had to go with what William Branham said on something because um, his viewpoint and my what became my viewpoint was that this is the right thing and you have to do the right thing. Um, so I can't say that that's positive. Um, Having that flexibility to give and take is really important. And that doesn't exist in a high demand group. There has to be a right way. And it's usually ends up being, you know, the way the group says the, what the rule is, what the, what the tape says. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I would say for my personal experience, dating somebody in a high demand group, when you're not in it yourself, it forced us to, to expend energy in our early relationship to get on the same page for what we were doing and why we were doing it. Well, there is lots of great stuff there. Christy, thank you so much. That went really deep and I appreciate all of that. What about you, Emily? Do you have any positives or negatives you wanted to bring out about dating? I'm just sitting here uh, enjoying the conversation, <laughs> taking it all in. And yeah, <clears throat> again, just, you know, dating and trying to figure myself out and dating in my mid forties uh, or mid early forties. I don't know how old I am right now. My birthday is in a couple days, but uh, I'd have to sit and do the math. I'm going to be 43. Um, dating and kind of processing and hitting different trauma triggers has been fascinating. And I'm very grateful for Pete's patience through it all because 
I was very naive in some things and not in others. And you have your, I think of the girls growing up obsessed with Disney princesses or things like that, you know, which is great. But sometimes when you're so sheltered, that is your ideal. I was never into Disney princesses, but uh, just what you're taught, who you're taught that you are as a woman and that you are nothing and that you're a byproduct of whatever and you're not part of the original creation, you know, that really devalues you. So I would venture to guess if you talk to young men in the group versus young women, what their dating experience is, it's vastly different because women, you just have a different viewpoint. And so now being outside of that and looking in, um, seeing where I'm at and how I value myself and how I carry myself, I think it creates a different dynamic in our relationship than it would have if I was dating in the message. So I don't know. It's all very fascinating. It's all very unique. And again, I think it's just really interesting how just the three of us with such similar backgrounds can have such different backgrounds in the <laughs> in the during this discussion. Yeah, that's an interesting point that a man's a man's experience or a young man's experience would be vastly different. And um, that was actually an idea for a show that I thought about. And maybe that'll be next year's Valentine's Day where we can have, if, if our significant others are interested, they could uh, kind of give us their perspective um, on what it was like to date us or marry us and so forth. I think it would be kind of fun. <laughs> So um, let's go ahead and move on to engagements. We can't spend as long on engagements as we did dating <laughs> because if we do, we're going to have a three or four hour show. <laughs> but anyway, um, as far as engagements go, um, we had a short engagement. As I said, um, we got engaged in July, got married in November. Um, I think that's pretty typical for people in our particular high demand group. And uh I, I remember because of the way that engagements were in our section of the message movement, it, an engagement was it. An engagement was your vows. Um, that was your husband. Once you were engaged, you were intended and there was, you really had no hope for any other relationships once you'd been engaged. Um, now I know people who have um, broken engagements and have been able to get married. And actually, I that's one of my regrets from being part of the message movement was that I was um, very legalistic about that. And people who moved on and married, I I didn't approve. And I, I'm, I'm mad at myself about that now because again, I have changed. And I'm glad I have changed in that respect because it was absolutely none of my business and I was being judgmental and that's horrible. Um, and uh, so that's something I've repented of. But anyway, um, because of that, I, I told John, we cannot be engaged until we have a ring and a date, because I wasn't, I was not going to be one of those girls who sat around as a spinster, um, regretting the fact that my fiance and I had not made it to the altar because I knew some people like that. And I was really sad for them. Anyway, that's as far as I'm going to go with engagement. That's my story. Um, that also talks about interference, pressure, um, I guess we could get into positives or negatives. Um, I think it's probably negative to be um, to have such a short time to get to know someone before you actually marry them. And it's certainly negative to feel like you must marry them since you've said, yes, you will. Um, but uh, Emily, you had your hand up, right? <laughs> did you want to talk? Go ahead. I did. I did. Talking about dating and engagement. So I got engaged this August. Don't have the date memorized. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> but it was on our way to Michigan to go to a graduation party for some good friends of mine that I knew when I lived overseas. They're, they'd come back and uh, we're having a graduation party. So on the way, uh, we stopped at Mackinac Island and that's where Pete proposed to me on the world's largest front porch at the Mackinac Island. I forget the name of the place right now while I'm thinking about it but it's there was a movie film there 
It's really a bizarre movie. But anyway, um, so got engaged, came back. I did call my parents, let them know that I was engaged. I was not expecting it right away because I knew the ring existed, but I knew it had to be resized and that was going to be a while. So he totally shocked me. Um, but there was disappointment. The fact that my 40 something year old boyfriend, now fiance, did not ask my father permission to marry me. Someone who is also in their 40s has moved 7,000 miles away, lived overseas, done all this, had a very, you know, successful life, came back, uh, and didn't ask daddy for the hand in marriage, which was like, I was not expecting that. Apparently Pete was not surprised by that little comment that was made. Like, Oh yeah, he never asked me. Um, and I can, I get it, you know, seeing his perspective, my father's perspective being still in that group and the expectations that are put on him as a father. Um, but yeah, that, <laughs> that that's my engagement story. <laughs> that's really comical. And Lee, I remember that um, John did ask my dad if it was okay if we got married. He already knew I was going to marry him, but he, uh, my dad's reply was like the parents of the blind or the, it was a blind or lame man that Jesus um, healed. And then I think it was a lame man and um, his family was going to be put out of the temple for associating with Jesus. And so the temple leaders were asking them who healed your son and they said he's of age ask him that was my dad's response she's of age ask her see that absolves him of any responsibility right he doesn't have to you know if, if, our, if the relationship doesn't work out then it's on me so anyway my dad's my dad's a sweetheart but <laughs> that was his thinking at the time anyway so um i got i got engaged we were actually at a church camp that weekend um, it was a beautiful place. Uh, it was like, you know, probably 10, 20 acres of land on this, this, uh, this gentleman's property. We had a tent meeting out there. It was in Georgia. <clears throat> and um, my husband said, be up, be ready. We're going to eat breakfast. Um, he had breakfast prepared and we had breakfast together. I had no idea that this was happening. I just got up and got ready for the tape meeting services and he took me out on a dock and proposed to me. So we were just right in the middle of message things happening all around us um, when we got engaged. He did ask my dad, um, you know, I was 19 when he, when I got engaged. So it's a slightly different. Um, I don't know if my dad was expecting it quite that soon, but I knew he knew that that's where we were going with our relationship and that it was going to be coming down the pipeline. And my dad's response was, are you going to treat her right? And my husband said, yes. And so that was that. He's like, she can do what she wants. You know, if you're going to treat her right, I'll be fine with it. Um, my dad had already vetted him over the course of our relationship. Um, my dad's a big baseball fan. And uh, the umpires in baseball, they carry a little plastic device. <clears throat> and it keeps track of balls and strikes. Um, and then the outs, you know. And my dad had that. And he screwed it into my wall. You walk into my bedroom on the left-hand side, right by the door, there was a baseball clicker, like an umpire clicker with balls and strikes. And he would keep track of balls and strikes for my boyfriends. And uh, at that point, my future husband, he had three balls on the count, you know, and he didn't have any strikes yet. So I think that might have had something to do with it. He was ahead in the count, you know. So my dad said yes. And... Uh, yeah, we got engaged. It was a very happy time. He got me a beautiful ring. Um, you know, I was just giddy as could be. Since you all both told your uh, getting engaged proposal stories, I'll have to tell mine because otherwise John will be disappointed. I'll never hear the end of it. <laughs> so we um, had purchased a ring. Um, it was getting resized. It was supposed to be resized by a certain date. Um, and we were going to go to the old spaghetti factory and he was going to formally propose and ask for my hand in marriage um, with the ring. Well, he went to get the ring on the date we thought it was supposed to be ready and it was not ready. So we still went on a date, but we saved our money. We didn't go to the old spaghetti factory. We went through the White Castle drive through <laughs> We went down by the river, the Ohio River. And um, my husband 
asked for my hand in marriage. He said, I am just so disappointed. I will not survive the night if I cannot ask you to marry me today because this was what I was expecting. And um, we, so we had White Castles in the back seat and we were in the front seat and he asked me if I would be his wife. And I said, yes. And he now had the funny story to tell the rest of his life. <laughs> and that's John in a nutshell. We still did go to the old spaghetti factory after we got the ring and we did have the romantic moment, but he did have to do that because that would be the funny story to tell the grandchildren. <laughs> I just want to affirm what you say about the engagement being as serious as the wedding, basically. And I'm wondering how many young women in a high demand group, you know, the man has now gotten the girl and maybe he drops his facade and now she's starting to question and she would like to be out and to say no and to not get married, but yet feels trapped. I know a particular situation very close to me where there was an engagement and it was like very traumatic when the girl wanted to say no and there had to be fathers involved and reasons on why this engagement could be broken. And it was like always this kind of weird shadow that followed the the people that broke the engagement then and and just thinking about that pressure and anybody that's listening and feeling that pressure that's not right as as a woman you're not married yet you haven't said i do you haven't said forever um it's okay to walk away if you are thinking this is not for you maybe the young man is um showing a side of himself that you don't appreciate uh so stop talk about it process it and know an engagement is not a marriage and yeah i i think that's my encouragement to anyone listening um that pressure is unrealistic and I don't think it's healthy for any young woman that has to deal with that pressure and feel that pressure. Even, you know, God forbid a girl get pregnant and the man's abusive and I need to marry this man because now I have his child. There's so many more options out there and you should not put yourself in an abusive situation. You are, are like, you have so much more value than that. God created you in his image and this is not your lot in life and there's so much more freedom and you're worth so much more that's that's my thought on the engagement absolutely topic. i agree with you 100 percent, and i want to say that right now for anyone who is in a relationship where they feel threatened or they are uncomfortable or they feel abused please reach out. Um, I'm going to ask that um, in, a, in the description underneath this video that um, we will have some resources there, some, some websites, some phone numbers. If you need help, if you need to get out of an abusive relationship, we would definitely encourage you to do that. We're going to move on, I guess, to weddings. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, I have so many things to say about my wedding. <laughs> First of all, I'm going to talk about the dress and I'm going to get John to put a picture of my dress up. I haven't sent it to him yet, but I will. And um, my dress was beautiful. I love it. I still love it. I wish I fit in it still. Um, it was made by a seamstress because you wouldn't find a dress on the rack that would have both made me feel comfortable and also fit the message guidelines. But it, it was a beautiful dress. It was a very expensive dress that cost as much as the flowers, it cost as much as the food for the reception. Um, it was a very <laughs> expensive dress. And so when I think about the biblical definition of modesty, no, it wasn't modest. It, it covered everything. There was nothing showing that shouldn't have shown, but it was not modest. It was very expensive. I, I paid for it myself because I was working and I was able to do that. But um, we also made three trips from Indiana to Ohio for fittings and to make sure that the dress would fit on the day of the wedding. But we um, we splurged on Venice lace, which is cotton lace, um, probably handmade if I had to guess. But it's beautiful. But I wouldn't I wouldn't call it modest by the by the definition of not costing a lot of money, which I think that's what Paul was talking about because he said not with expensive clothing or or jewels or things like that. He was talking about you know not 
not being gaudy or over the top. My, my wedding dress was over the top, but I was happy with it. So my wedding, um, we were broke college students at the time. And so everything had to be done on a budget. Um, there was a lot of issues going on in my family that were, it was completely not message high demand group related, just my family having issues. Um, so we didn't have a lot of help. Um, my ideal, what I, when we sat down for the first time, me and my husband and talked about what we wanted to do for our wedding, my ideal was to have something super small, like me and my husband, maybe a few witnesses, a minister, and I wanted to get married at sunrise and then have breakfast after. That was like, to me, I don't know why. That just seemed so romantic to me. I was talked out of that because a wedding is a public declaration. It is a covenant that you do in front of the church and the assembly. I mean, it had to have the pomp and the circumstance, right? Um, so that was that was very much frowned upon when I voiced this opinion. And so it was reworked. Um, my breakfast wedding became a late afternoon wedding and um, the ladies at the church pitched in and we had a beautiful array of food served at the wedding. Um, it wasn't quite potluck. It was more planned than that, but it was certainly like a lot of pitching in for it. Um, we had the wedding. I had one of the other issues that we had like big question marks, like, are they serious about following the Lord? Um, it was when we chose our venue because the, the message church we attended would not have fit. Um, the number of people who were going to be attending our wedding. So we had it at the local garden club. And that was very much like, why aren't you having it inside of a church? Um, but that's where we did it. And uh, my dress was lovely too. I'll share a picture with John so it can, it can get shared. But um, my dress was really beautiful. Um, it was not what I had planned on getting. But we went into the dress shop, me and my best friend one day, we were just looking around and I saw this dress and I said, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And so that's what I got. It was not modest enough. Um, the bodice had to be adjusted um, to be, you know, more coverage. The I had to have a jacket fashion for it um, so that it would cover my shoulders and have some sleeves. Um, but it was a beautiful, beautiful dress. It had beads that went all the way down the back, just really delicate, pretty dress. Um, couldn't have been happier with that. Yeah. Our wedding was, uh, was lovely. If I had to do over, I would have done my dream wedding, which would have been my small thing. And I really wanted like an orange juice fountain. I thought that sounded really cool. Um, but yeah, so wedding planning is really fun. Um, when you're in a high demand group, there's all kinds of different little strings that get attached. For me, I was learning the strings as I went around planning it. Emily is going to have such a fun time planning her wedding free of all of that nonsense. And did you have anything to add, Emily? Because you're more than welcome to talk from your perspective as someone who used to be in a high demand group, but you get to have your wedding the way you want it. I do. And the thing is, I there's... I'm excited about the fact that my friends from all around and possibly overseas are going to come and celebrate with us. And it's going to be super non-traditional. Um, we're going to, we're, we're debating three different pastors who we want to have. Um, I haven't fully decided yet. And because, yeah, you know, being out, you see the freedom and you see the different denominations. And I, there's like a woman Methodist pastor in consideration. And then there's the worship leader uh, or worship pastor at our church who is a man. And then there's our neighbor lay pastor uh, from the local Lutheran church that are all in consideration because of who they are as individuals. And that's something I discovered um, traveling around is I'm not choosing a church based on what the name is on the door. I want to know what do they teach and what's the pastor like. So and then dress, like, I don't know. I just want to be comfortable and I'm not like the frilly white dress person. So we're actually thinking um, Pete's more kind of fashion color. He's helping coordinate with my friend who's um, 
kind of helping us in the wedding coordination area. And so Pete's picking out the colors and having very strong decisions in decorations and stuff. And I think it's going to be fabulous because I don't have an eye for that. And so I have a team of lady friends that are helping me out, try to figure out what I'm having for a dress. It's probably going to be non-traditional with a little bit of color and flair and be fun and comfortable. And so, and of course, match the outfit that Pete has already picked out for himself. So it's going to be great, but you know, Without interference, we want to actually, I just talked to someone today, a friend of mine, um, his son makes wine. And so I'm making a deal to trade some grapes from my parents' orchard for wine. And we want to have wine and we want to have some whiskey and Pete wants to have a celebratory cigar and it's all you know, not in excess and we want to have fun music. And Pete's got this great idea of having music videos. So you can have the music, but yet have the visual of the videos and the lyrics. And so it's going to be a great time, but then, you know, discussing mom's like, well, you know, you're not going to have too much alcohol. Are you? No, we can have alcohol without it being an excess. You know, it's not like we're going to haul out a couple half barrels or full barrels of beer and, you know, like a traditional Wisconsin wedding. But, you know, it's 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 fun to be able to plan um, just what we what what does Team Emily and Team Pete want for their wedding to remember the day and to celebrate? So that's exciting. And there's this beautiful like lodge at a local church camp that we're going to use and the reception and the wedding are going to be at the same place. We're not going to be married in a church. If it's nice outside, we're hoping to coordinate with my friend who's going to help us with the sound that we can actually maybe do it outside. We're going to go back to the camp once winter is over um, and kind of check out the grounds and see, hey, maybe we can flex on the day of and have the the actual wedding ceremony outside and it's not going to be a lot of pomp and circumstance you know maybe 10 minutes and our ceremony will be over um i think the one thing i do want is the very after the whoever is marrying us pronounces us husband or wife i do want to take communion together i think that would just be a really fun kind of symbolic thing of here we are we're on this journey together honoring god um, with our life and uh, moving forward, even though we, <laughs> Pete and I joke, our wedding is going to be a little bit too religious for our non-religious friends, and it's going to be too non-religious for some of our religious friends. So it's probably going to be a lot of non-happy people, and we're inviting who we want just because you're on a certain level of a family tree or a friend level doesn't mean that you're automatically getting an invite because, you know, if you're cool and we hang out with you and we enjoy going to dinner with you you'll probably be invited so yeah it's <laughs> it's a lot of a lot of freedom in it so it's been pretty fun but yeah a little bit of behind the scenes influence from the high demand group but just trying to do our best as a team to move forward and kind of appease them but yet do our own thing too you're kind of getting into a future topic. I think our one of our next topics is going to be about family boundaries, and um, so that'll that'll that's kind of a hint toward what's coming up. But uh, anyway, I did get to have a fountain at my wedding. I had a punch fountain, <laughs> of course, non-alcoholic punch, and um, that was that was fun. But um, I remember, I remember when we were at, I think it was the rehearsal. Yeah. It was the rehearsal and uh, John's grandfather wanted to have a serious talk with me. John's grandfather was the pastor of the Branham Tabernacle. We were being married at the Branham Tabernacle and uh, John's grandfather told me, now you need to realize this, no matter how he treats you, you are never to look after another man. And um, that was disappointing to me to say the least. First of all, why would he think I would ever look at another man besides my husband? And second of all, why would he think it is his grandson would treat me any way other than he should treat his wife. But that so that was just one of the weirdest things that ever happened. And then the the other weird thing that happened was his grandfather forgot to tell him to kiss the bride. <laughs> now he did 
go ahead and kiss me at the altar. He did get a kiss in there at the altar, but uh, not because his grandpa remembered to tell me to kiss, tell him to kiss the bride. But I, uh, I did mention when we were talking earlier about our wedding that um, there was new regulations for weddings put up right before our wedding. And I don't think it was because they thought our wedding was necessarily going to cross over a lot of lines. But I think there was, it was sometimes it seems like churches go through wedding seasons. And I think we were sort of in a wedding season and they, and I don't think anybody gets uh, married in the Brandon Tabernacle now. They all have different venues where they go, but they nobody goes to the Brandon Tabernacle. Of course, they don't even have church in the Brandon Tabernacle now. They all listen to tapes outside of church based on the sermon that they're told to listen to by the people over at Voice of God Recordings. But anyway, um, there some of the rules that were up were about... Um, you had you were not to have any movie themes. You were only to have Christian music, and we really wanted um, we really wanted the church pianist to play the piano at our wedding. And she was not necessarily sure she wanted to do that. But when we told her that all the songs came out of the hymnal, then, then she was on board with it. So, um, and there were you know there were probably other songs we would have liked to have had besides just the songs in the hymnal, but. Um, it was worth it to get that lady to play play for us because the other person who would have been possibly could have played for us was going to be my maid of honor. So I didn't want her to have to play. And she did wound up singing a song, um, another Christian song. So anyway, um, that was that was our wedding. And it was stressful as it could be. My mom was um, at the reception hall helping prepare with her, with all my family, um, which a lot of them were bridesmaids. Um, I was by myself. I went, I was at home curling my hair because you have to curl your hair when you're getting married. I locked my car keys in the house. So in my wedding shoes, I climbed through the window and over the kitchen sink to get inside to get my car keys so I could drive myself to the church. And I got there. And I think the only only person there was the florist. So it was it was stressful there for a little bit, but it, it ended up being just fine. <laughs> and like I said, we're still happily married 28 years later. When I got married, they did not we our church did not have any such rules about the music. So I actually had beautiful music. Um we hired some local musicians that I knew. Um, it was a, a young lady that I had gone to school with and her father, um, and they played violin and piano. It was beautiful music. Uh, music's oh, a huge part of my life, so I was really excited to get to have the music that I wanted um, played at my wedding. So we had the movie themes and, you know, all of the things that wouldn't have been allowed at your wedding, Jen. Um, so we had that. We also, we had one really unusual thing played at our wedding, and that was uh, William Branham preached a marriage ceremony that was recorded on tape. And it's about, I think it's 11 minutes long. And that played before our marriage ceremony uh, to the great confusion of half of the guests at the, at the wedding. Um, so that was interesting. Uh, somebody suggested it while we were planning our wedding. One of the brothers at the church had suggested that. He said, you know, if I was getting married again, I would definitely have Brother Branham preach at our wedding. And we, you know, being 19, we're like, that sounds awesome. That'll really cement the fact that we mean business when it comes to this high demand group, right? So we did that. Um, it's, it's still to this day, one of those things I just shake my head at when I think about like, why was I talked into doing that? So strange. Um, but yeah, so that happened. And, uh, but we did have beautiful music. Me and my hat, my husband actually danced. We waltzed at our wedding. Um, so we, nobody else danced. We had one dance. It was just me and him, you know, cause dancing is not something you do in the message. Um, but we did get that opportunity as well, which was really special. That is so awesome. What you said, and also what Emily said earlier, reminded me a lot of my oldest cousin. He um, he was, uh, I think he's only been married for about 10 years. So he was older than I was when he got married. Um, but he, he and his bride were very, very devoted Christians. And they did have communion at their wedding. But they also, since my my brother was going to be in the wedding. Um, I don't remember if he was the best man or just a groomsman. I think he may have been the best man. 
um, he had to learn how to do a certain kind of swing dance because they were swing dancers. And so my brother, who was not in the message anymore, but had been raised in the message, had to go learn how to do swing dance. And he didn't know if it was West Coast swing or East Coast swing. And I think he may have wound up um, choosing the wrong one to get lessons in. But he enjoyed that for a number of years. And um, all because my cousin had that as part of his wedding. This has been fun and interesting. And <laughs> I'm just still fascinated by how vastly different the three of ours experiences. And I think that's going to be really great for the listeners. Well, I think I think weddings are as different as people are different. <laughs> as everyone can see, we still have wonderful memories of our weddings. Those of us who married when we were um, in part of the high demand group. And Emily's looking very much forward to her wedding, which is not going to be part of a high demand group. But I do think that's one thing everyone has in common is that they all love a good wedding. They love to see people um, starting to live out their happily ever after. And uh, so hopefully this will be an episode that people can look at and uh, shake their heads and smile and laugh and remember the good things about their weddings if they had some good memories of those. But anyway, as far as that goes, wherever you are in life, I want you all to remember that life goes on and healing will happen. You just have to keep moving forward. 